Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Healthcare Training in Virtual Environments webinar. Uh, I am joined by Jeff Bund from Vario and Dr. Rafael Grossman, who has over 25 years of surgical experience. And let's go ahead and move on to the next slide so you can see our lovely pictures that more or less match our faces right now. Uh, so the three of us are going to be talking a little bit about how you can really leverage virtual reality and biosensor tools in the healthcare space. So we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. You may be asking yourself, why would you use VR in the healthcare space in the first place? And the answer is that there have been a variety of uses for many years, uh, ranging from phobia research to more, more recently surgical training and surgical research. And there have been many advances in recent years in virtual reality tools that have really allowed for the widespread use of this technology in different settings within the healthcare field. We'll move on to the next slide. Now, in just the, five, the last five years alone, there have been over 100,000 publications looking on VR and healthcare simulation. So the simulation space is really growing. And within the simulation space, over 22,000 publications focus on using these tools in a surgical training environment uh, for surgical residents and medical students. And as with the VR technology, there have been major advances in the actual environments with which students actually interact to do their surgical training. So I have two examples shown in this image uh, that actually show you some of the hyper-realistic tools that are available for students to really leverage these different environments for their surgical training. And these tools really allow medical professionals and trainees to properly leverage these tools in actually becoming better surgeons and better physicians. So if we move on to the next slide, a number of studies have been done on this as I've already reported, and there, all of these studies significantly show, all these studies show significant increases in performance as well as perceived self-confidence when the surgical interns are going through these different tasks. Uh, so these studies name a number of reasons for why the surgical training uh, in the virtual environments can help above and beyond just the traditional techniques. And some of these reasons that stick out are an improved procedural memory or procedural process orientation with the different surgical tools that are available. Now, Dr. Grossman will talk a little bit more about the procedural memory and process associated with surgery a little bit later on. But one thing that I've noticed is missing in some of these studies uh, not all, but some of these studies tend to focus on the full surgical experience and self-report or behavioral indices, which absolutely are useful, but they don't really tap into the underlying mechanisms that lead to these behavioral outcomes. So there may be certain aspects of the surgery that are deemed more cognitively taxing or more stressful, and self-report doesn't really tap at that. However, tools such as biosensors definitely can provide more insight into these underlying mechanisms. So if we go to the next slide, biosensors do indeed provide deeper insights into behavioral outcomes. Tools such as eye tracking that is built into virtual reality headsets provide insight into visual attention. So what elements of the surgical room are attended to? Are there key elements that aren't really attended to that should be? Uh, and you can associate that with other tools such as electrodermal activity or EDA that give you an in index of underlying emotional arousal. Now this emotional arousal can be as uh, associated with different motivational states, but when you really leverage these tools together, you get a deeper picture into what's going on as the surgical students are interacting with these virtual environments. This is wonderful, but historically biosensor research has been a bit tricky to set up. Fortunately, we have a solution for you. So we go on to the next slide. iMotions provides a solution for you in that it actually streamlines biosensor research by integrating a number of these different modalities, such as eye tracking for visual attention and EDA for emotional arousal, as well as other biosensor modalities, and synchronizes them in one easy to use software. So if we go on to the next slide, I can tell you a little bit about how this works. Basically, our platform not only synchronizes all of these tools into one place, but it actually provides researchers with real-time live views of these signals that they can pair together for qualitative insights 
And then they can dive a bit more deep using some of the analysis and annotation tools that we'll cover a little bit later on uh, for eye tracking to really aggregate across individuals and gain more insights. So on the next slide, I have a fun little example. Uh, in this example, we are actually using the Vario headset paired with an EDA sensor in a um, phobia environment, let's call it. So my friend here is scared of spiders, and we can actually see whether she's visually attending to these oversized spiders and what her underlying emotional, uh, emotional arousal is measured by the GSR. So we can actually see here, is she looking at the spiders? Is she looking away as soon as she sees them? Are there GSR spikes or EDA spikes when she sees them? And this is really useful to triangulate all of these together with the visual attention and the underlying emotional arousal. So the benefit of using our two tools together is that you can pair everything together nicely in one easy to use package and gain further insights in doing so. So if we move on to the next slide, I'm actually going to go ahead and let Jeff take over and talk a little bit more about what Vario provides in virtual reality. Yeah, thanks, Roxana. Um, I'll keep this a bit brief, but I want to talk about a couple of the things in the Vario headset that allowed us to do what we're doing today. Um, can you go to the first slide? Yeah, there it is. Um, and so I'll focus on two main features. One is the human eye resolution, and the other is uh, our integrated eye tracking. Um, the first thing about our, our displays are that they deliver 2020 human eye resolution to the user. And what that means is in our headset, you can look at everything like you could in real life. We call it 62 pixels per degree. Some people call it one arc minute. Um, but basically, it looks very good and it looks very sharp. Um, and then the other thing that's integrated into all our devices is an eye tracking system that was built uh, you know, in parallel with the headset. So we have a bunch of advantages at Vario uh, in terms of the fact that we've built an eye tracker that's designed to go into a headset instead of retrofitting an eye tracker into a head mounted display. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so this exploded diagram shows how we accomplish what, what we do. So at the top, what you can see are two uh, what we call focus or context displays. And then on the sides are our focus displays. And they're blended using a series of optics and mirrors um, that uh, result in a very, very sharp image being delivered to the center field of view of the user. At the bottom of the diagram, you can see the rings and the other components that go into uh, the glint system, which allows us to, to uh, build our eye tracker both like elegantly integrated and also uh, able to do really high performance measurements of eye behavior. Uh, next slide, please. So it's always tricky to deliver this over uh, the web, and we've, we've had a lot of discussion at Vario about how we communicate our resolution uh, over the internet, but this slide is an attempt at that, and what you can see is uh, the difference between a conventional enterprise headset and a Vario headset. Um, on, the, the other, on the other headset, there's chromatic aberration, there's screen door effect, and there's general you know, lack of resolution and detail and blurriness in the image. And on the right side, in our headset, you can read the text, you can uh, look at the buttons and dials, and you can interact with the controllers uh, in a way that's much more lifelike. We found this is super important because an end user, a trainee, um, won't have to do things like lean forward, squint, or do other things um, when they're going through an experience that would introduce negative training or otherwise distract from the experience. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, this, this graphic overlay shows how our tracker works. Uh, the green shapes are the structure of infrared light. And uh, they're, they're shined into the light in a specific way that's integrated into our rear optics. And basically what it allows us to do is, is get really nice measurements of uh, variation and distance in pupil movement. Um, and our tracker is accurate to under one degree. And if you want to know what one degree uh, looks like, you can hold your hand out, hold your thumb up, and the width of your thumbnail is roughly one degree of the field of view. Um, 
So what's really cool about all of this is that the resolution combined with the accuracy of the tracker allows, uh, allows us to get really nice information about what's happening in a training experience because a trainee can read text or inter interact with fine detail and we can measure that in equally as fine detail with the tracker. And what it basically leads to is just a really nice meta layer of analysis that can happen over, over a training or a curriculum. Um, and the last slide, please. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll just gloss over this, but this shows um, how, how this can be put into practice using heat maps and annotations and how one might start using this, but I'll let Roxanne and Raphael go into much more detail. Thank you. Yeah, great. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about what tools are available for healthcare training um, because we've heavily leveraged one of the most advanced tools out there. And then I'll throw it over to Dr. Grossman for more insights into what we did. So let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. So there are a number of different uh, virtual surgical training environments out there. And the one that we heavily leveraged was created by Orama VR. Orama VR provides multiple healthcare specific training simulations that really use these hyper realistic simulation based training setups to allow surgical trainees to walk through the processes in a very procedural fashion. Uh, and make it as lifelike as possible with haptic feedback paired with the strong visualizations. So uh, this is beneficial for surgical training because it's kind of a fail-safe environment. It's a little bit less of a risk than going straight to you know, the more um, traditional methods. Uh, so we leveraged one of these, if you, uh, if you can go ahead and go on to the next slide, uh, for a, a setup in which we had two novices uh, so myself and, and one of our colleagues go through a knee replace, a total knee anthroscopy, and I'm sure that I said that incorrectly, so I'll let Raphael correct me, uh, where we actually walked through a training setup, and then we had Raphael go through it himself as an expert. And you'll see the replays in just a moment in what it looks like when you have novices who know nothing about surgery going through this virtual environment and quickly picking up these procedural, the procedural memory and processes versus an expert who's been doing this for over 25 years. So if we go on to the next slide, I'm gonna just turn it over to Raphael and he can talk more about what we did. Yes, uh, thanks uh, Roxana. It's uh, great to be here and had the chance to, uh, to uh, discuss a bit of this, which is a passion of mine. Uh, as a surgeon, uh, I'm an educator, right? Uh, we, uh, we train, we train the next generation of, of students uh, and uh, the next generation of, uh, of doctors, of surgeons. And um, I've, uh, I've been for years passionate about how technology can really uh, make uh, us better, uh, better teachers and better uh, learners. And uh, one of the, the things that um, uh, excite me is exponential technologies like uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, uh, XR or extended uh, mixed reality, right? And um, in any case, uh, uh, having the opportunity to, to work with Vario uh, is just amazing. I, I've, I think I've, I've had every VR headset in, in, in history in my hands at some point or maybe in my face, I think. And uh, but you know we, we clearly see the evolution of of, uh, of the platform of the hardware and, and the software. And uh, uh, the first time I use Valio uh, is really I, I, I kind of jokingly call it is like looking through a window. You know you got that 20 20 uh, human eye resolution where you know you always have a little bit of a you know sort of a TV on your on your face right when you put a headset a VR headset but with, with audio it's like you're you're there you're looking through a window and the environment that you see there it's uh, it, it's just an unbelievable uh, resolution and there's no conflict of interest on any of this uh, <laughs> testimonies that I'm giving um, by the way but uh, in any case uh, uh, being able to uh, to uh, immerse uh, oneself in a, a surgical simulation it's uh, it, it has a uh, an incredible amount of benefits. Uh, many of them are not even uh, tangible benefits. Uh, the tangible ones are the ones that have been studied, you know, after, you know, thousands and thousands of, of, of papers. Uh, being able to, uh, uh, you know, as a surgeon, when we do procedural uh, uh, learning and procedural teaching, uh, it's important to uh, 
remember, you know, we, we always say, you know, you, you got to know why you do the surgery and you know how to do the surgery. And and uh, so uh, the step by step learning that is very important. A, a surgery is a sort of a, a spectator type of uh, of uh, of, uh, of a career. Uh, it's always a career as a student, but uh, when you're learning how to do surgery, you you are watching, you know, someone do surgery and you see. Uh, how to do surgery, you watch it, and then uh, people say, you know, the old surgical uh, um, adage is that you see one, you uh, uh, do one, and then you teach one. It's kind of the same way, but, um, you know, that scene, the surgery, is what has changed over the years. We would uh, still, uh, you're an apprentice, you are, you're kind of watching someone do surgery and learning how to do it, learning all the steps, and then you kind of try it with help, and then you kind of do it on your own, and then you teach someone how to do that. Having the opportunity to not work, obviously, on uh, intuitively, obviously not on patients directly to learn, uh, but uh, maybe on on mannequins, right? And uh, now on digital patients, on and digital virtual uh, subjects, uh, like a, a VR simulation allows us to do. So, uh, having the opportunity to put a headset, which is almost like looking at a a, a real a, a subject, human subject in there, and uh, having the platform evolve in such a way uh, like Orama VR has created this platform that is like being inside the OR. So when you put the headset on, you're inside the OR, just like the, the video that I have there, which is a real OR, obviously, and you see me kind of, you know, moving in, 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 in space, but inside the a value, I am in this digital OR and I have the subject in front of me, or at least part of the subject. I just see that big knee there. And by the way, I'm a trauma surgeon. I do trauma surgery and acute care surgery and half of what we do, what I do is elective surgery. I'm not a, 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 a bone doctor. I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. So as a as a trainee many years ago, I did a, a lot of uh, orthopedic surgery and some arthroplasties, which is uh, basically reshaping a knee, right, or or or, or giving you a new knee. But uh, uh, this uh, was interesting for me as a general surgeon who does kind of almost every kind of surgery except <laughs> bone orthopedic surgery to have this platform because I was sort of an expert, but really I was a novice in that sense because I hadn't done it for so many years. But then it, the, the learning curve is, is pretty quickly, and and one of the reasons is that it, it's so immersive and so realistic that you go in there and uh, so I, I knew which tools to, to use and I knew but so that that's only part of the story because then when you have a obviously a very realistic environment and uh, you know imagine a, 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 a jumbo jet a, a ready to, to fly a plane you know you don't do that unless you have done hours and hours and hours of simulation. You don't want to have a plane with 500 people and then be learning how to fly. Same thing applies in here. You're, 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 you're really a plane with, uh, with, with, with human lives, right? With human health, uh, with the limbs and, uh, in this case. So um, a, the, the other part of the story, as I was saying, is uh, being able to, to measure, you know, how do you learn? And, uh, you know, as a surgeon, we were uh, very, uh, a, a focus on the uh, ergonomy of, uh, of movement, right? You don't want to be wasting time when you do things. If, if you can just go grab something, you go grab something, not going around and grab something. So a, a way of, of uh, in a way, measuring this in an objective fashion is uh, uh, having eye tracking, you know, like the Vario, uh, the VR2 has, like eye motions provide, and not just eye tracking, but many other, you know, biosensor uh, uh, variables, which uh, in a way tell the story of how are you doing? You, maybe you look like you're doing a good job, but you are really, your heart is racing at 150 <laughs> beats per minute, and you're sweating, and you're really stressed out, and you will, you're not going to tolerate this sort of pays for, you know, more than maybe a few minutes or a couple of hours. So it's really important to to achieve that, uh, uh, you know, we, you probably heard about the, the zone, right? We, we want to be in the zone. We want to be in the, in the, in the it's uh, uh, very relaxed and very focused and nothing else matters but what you're doing. So one way to, to get there, to train yourself to get there is having a very realistic environment, which the Vario and Orama VR provides, but then being able to measure all those physiologic uh, points that uh, eye motions allow uh, uh, us to um, to measure. So when you put all that together, you are not just improving performance, but you are uh, uh, measuring in a way indirectly the performance. So when you can have the same procedure done 
a, a almost a, 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 a gross view a, a, in a similar fashion, but you measure and someone's heart rate, you know, is really calm and the GSR, you know, is low and you're not stressed and you're really, you can do this for hours and you're enjoying it, you're doing your best possible, having the best outcome, the best result versus someone who appears to be doing the same procedure, maybe the same time, maybe no errors, maybe, a, you know, everything looked grossly a, from the outside very much the same but when you measure the inside and you see that person is really going through a lot of stress and they're not going to be able to so that is not that person is not ready to fly that jet eh? so that's kind of the, the way the way i see it so uh, in a way uh, uh, you know wh when i when i got the the the, the set the, i actually tried this headset uh, probably over a year ago but the vr2 it's obviously a step up and then the eye motions uh, a, a capabilities and you put that on and you start being measured and uh, you know it takes a little uh, it, it, just being measured you know it raises your stress level a little bit but once you are in there and you forget about anything and you're looking through that window in the value too you know which is just is, is, is a big window i mean this is a device that is not uh, but when you get there and you are completely isolated and you are in that operating room with that patient in front of you and then you start working and at the end you see that all your the variables, your physiology relaxes, and you're doing your best. Is really a, an experience that uh, that is hard to, to to describe, and I think it's very important because uh, uh, you know we're not talking again a, a training for for a for a banal thing. We're talking about training to save lives and to you know improve someone's uh, health, and that's what you're what you have in your, in your hands. So uh, I I believe that uh, certainly a simulation. A, I, I'm, I'm a, been always passionate about simulation, but also a virtual simulation. I think is the the uh, you know the, not even the future. It's, it's the present. You know, there are several several uh, platforms out there. Orama VR, uh, Fundamental VR, also VR. There, there are many out there. It's not really the platform that's going to be pretty standard. I think uh, it kind of like the headsets. The headsets are going to be standard, and all the measuring of the variables is really where the kicker is. And in regards to uh, uh, whether this is something that that will completely substitute how we learn, I don't think it will. Substitute. I think that technology, if we use it in a smart way, will allow us to a, a, a supplement the way we do it. I'm not saying that you're not going to maybe use uh, physical models or mannequins of some type to learn some uh, a, 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 of the ways of doing surgery. Uh, you're not going to not work on, on, on human uh, uh, or in animal, uh, in, in vivo you know, uh, models. You're not going to not work in humans at some point because as an apprentice, you need to be taken through the real surgery by someone who's an expert. So all those uh, steps are part of the training, but this enhances and in a way it, 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 it really it augments you know the first phases of how to reach that level of, of it the zone and be an expert and how to maintain them because that's very important you don't just learn this and never do it again it's not like riding a bicycle really it, it, it's in a way a little bit of rising ride, ride a bicycle but but you really got to get better 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 and then stay better better by training 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 so that's why this uh, technology is really uh, is really i think the the certainly the the, the future how we're going to supplement how we learn to be surgeons or how to be a procedural in a way because that applies to really to many disciplines including uh, obviously healthcare and uh, and surgery and uh, uh, you know I, I just uh, feel that uh, that is interesting to, to see how technology has evolved and in just very few years ago you know the, the oculus came out and everyone was like what is this and we've been having trials at VR for many 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 years and uh, uh, we are to a point where VR has exponentially spiked to a level pretty much after the oculus came out to something like this looking through a window type uh, experience, which is the the Vario, the VR2, the VR1, and the, you know, and the XR1 as well. So uh, it's really um, it's really amazing to see this and to be able to to in a way uh, uh, collaborate uh, 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 in order to shape this platform the way it should be. Because this is something that should be, I think, a, a part of any a surgical a training a, a standard. I think that this is as important as going to OR to watch a surgery, to see a surgery, as important as reading the steps and learning the steps, as important as reading the basics of medicine. This is something that, that is indispensable to, to make part of a, a, of a surgical uh, a, a curriculum. So. Yeah, and to all of those excellent points, uh, especially the one talking about 
you know, this is the first step. This is meant to augment traditional training techniques um, and really just the degree to which you can improve. We actually have two videos showing how a novice um, who had never used this virtual environment or been in an OR uh, actually used these together. So if we go on to the next slide, this is an example. Uh, you can see the visual attention marked by the circles and the lines uh, to show this novice trying to perform this task. Uh, and it results in a critical error. And so you can see from the graphs below that the GSR act activity actually does peak uh, the, shortly after the critical error occurs, which could happen right now. Uh, I have no idea what I'm doing here, but I do see a big red error. Uh, and there's just a sudden backing away. So you can pair the eye tracking attention to the blood that's gushing out of the patient um, and the, the actual uh, setup itself to show that there is an increase in GSR arousal paired with where I'm looking, you know, the emergency that's going on. Um, and this was of course a first pass. So critical error. <laughs> and then if we move on to the next slide, uh, this was the third trial, and this was actually a trial with success. So Dr. Grossman mentioned, you know, newer surgical interns, th the heart rate is still going to be high, the GSR activity is still going to be high. You can see that uh, based on the graphs below. I had many EDA or GSR peak responses uh, because I was very nervous <laughs> about going through this task, but there was a market improvement based on the procedural, uh, on, the, on the process itself. So this is the stepwise process. It's a procedural task um, and allowing for this environment makes it a little bit easier to pick up. Uh, Dr. Grossman, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for any additional commentary on, on my, <laughs> my performance here. I think I heard that the patient did very well, so I think that you <laughs> did okay. <laughs> All right, perfect. Cool, so um, we're gonna go ahead and switch over to the next slide now. And so this is Dr. Grossman going through the task. Uh, you can see the eye tracking data um, and he's much more familiar with the processes and was able to complete each task a bit faster. We did talk about the, the visual guides. So uh, the novice may depend more or fixate more on those visual guides, whereas the expert is fixating on the tools themselves. Uh, so that's certainly something uh, worth noting here. Um, and the task itself is, of course, completed much faster. Uh, so that was interesting. And, and of course, we have an image of, of Dr. Grossman wearing the headset in an actual physical operating room, which really adds to uh, the reality of this and, and the um, situational memory associated with it. So I'll turn it back over to you for any input and further insights. Yeah, thank you, Roxana. So yeah, and uh, I, I, for some reason, I, I don't see my, you know, my measurements down there, but I can tell you, you know, I, I, it's, um, it's, um, it's pretty realistic. So it's, it's to the point where, I, you know, the first time it, it, it took to, uh, it, it takes a little uh, setting up, I think, to, to calibrate, you know, the motions, and uh, you know, you're not feeling anything. You know, your brain is tricking you into feeling, and you feel almost the bone cutting in there, but you don't really feel it. You're, you're seeing it so well. That's why the visuals that uh, 2020 human eye resolution is so important because it's like when you're doing robotic surgery and you don't feel anything because the patient is out there and you're doing robotic surgery, but you almost feel the tissue and you feel it because the resolution is so so high that your brain is you see the tissue deforming and looking differently when you grab it so it's the same thing in here when you when you when you see it so well so the first trial i i, I was almost done i was just just basically cutting the bone and uh, but you know the the angle on the saw was a little tricky and i went through that and the blood spurted it i thought you know it almost got stained with blood because it looks so realistic so then when the calibration was a little bit better then i could uh, take the steps a very kind of familiar steps in a way, but it's also you got the, the visual guides. So, uh, a, a, you know, to, to me, it was really 
I'm, I'm pretty sure my measurements were were, were very uh, very uh, you know relaxed or 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 or, or appropriate uh, or ideal I would say the uh, the other thing is that the eye track you kind of know what to look for you know that you know the next step is going to be looking you know grabbing that that uh, you know if you have the drill you know the next step is getting the guides and the next step is getting the set and then the next step is getting the the, the saw and and uh, so uh, you have that uh, efficiency uh, of movements that efficiency of where do you look you're not looking everywhere and what do i know next or looking for other clues so i think that uh, the visual guides and the being able to see where your eyes are looking that that's very important and that's very important i think for for measuring and for improving then uh, performance because uh, you know uh, not just for procedural uh, uh, simulation and, and training but uh, you know imagine for many other things you know you, you could be uh, you know in, in a good way and a bad way but if you want to see the good way of it, you know, if you see where the eyes are looking, that, that's very important because when you're learning how to do a, a procedure or how to maneuver through things, it's, it's really key that you know what to expect next and that you go there in the shortest way, in the most efficient and most ergonomic way impossible and I, I briefly also want, want to mention you know when I w w when we started doing VR simulations it looked like a like almost like a little video game you know you're, you're cutting a knee or you're doing something in the abdomen or those little video games to do surgery to something like this that is this very very realistic right and almost fools the brain to, to think that this is the real thing and you get a, almost concerned that you don't want to make a mistake because someone might you know suffer from that but um, there's two things that I always talk about, uh, and that's something that uh, with uh, with uh, this other company that I mentioned, Fundamental VR, which I have no no uh, also conflict of interest with them, um, they have added a haptic feature uh, in combination with HapX, which is a sort of a, 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 a you, you can feel the touch on a glove in a virtual environment. So HapX uh, or Sense Glove is another company, and this is going to be pretty routine very soon, I think, because there are other iterations of these products. I think the holy grail of a virtual reality a, a training, a, you know, focusing on training and education, but I think in general in virtual reality, the holy grail is really the, the feeling, the, the haptics. Because once you have this level of visual, and you are almost looking through that window on the on the headset, now you need to now feel that real image and the way to feel it is a, a with the, with the haptics so i think that you know the visuals you know the measurement of the physiologic uh, variables you know the biosensors and the haptics are really a combination that 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 we revolutionize how we uh, how we train how we train and how we learn uh, procedures yeah definitely so uh, I think with regards to the measurements, um, and and this question may have may have already come up um, in the questions. If we move on to the next slide, uh, we can kind of talk about the takeaway, right? So there is the actual process of going through um, the task itself, and that does, uh, especially with the eye tracking, is, is very beneficial. And so really pairing these two tools together uh, allows not only for you know if an individual wants to take a look at their own replay to see if they can gain insights from their uh, experience, or if we want to aggregate this across the trainees. That's something that the, the tool set that we provide really allows, and this is something that, as Dr. Grossman said, will become more and more streamlined as these uh, virtual surgical tools become more commonplace in training scenarios. Uh, so really what you can do is leverage things like area of interest metrics, such as time to first fixation or time spent on a particular area, and aggregated heat maps of the visual attention. And so this gives you an overview uh, across all of the surgical tra trainees or participants in a given study, uh, what were they attending to? And so in this uh, example of the heat maps and AOIs, these vid images below, you can see kind of what the aggregated uh, visual attention on the um, patient vitals are. So if the vitals start slipping, are the physicians actually looking at the appropriate parts of the display? Uh, and so this not only can help with the trainees to know where to attend to visually, um, but also perhaps for um, future medical needs, actually setting up the operating rooms in an efficient manner. Uh, so that's kind of one of the things that we can take away, and, and I'm sure Dr. Grossman has, has more to add on, on some of these output measures as well. 
Yeah, no, exactly as you as you said, Roxana. I don't think I have really much to much to add. I think it's so important, you know, to be able to measure those, uh, you know, those, those metrics. That's uh, that's really key to to improve. I think and to measure improvement. Yeah, definitely. Improvement and performance feedback, I think, are really the main takeaways here from what we can leverage these tools with. So I, I think that was it for our overview. If you want to move on to the next slide. Uh, so what we're going to ask you next is just a quick poll. Um, if you are interested in learning more about iMotions, Vario, or uh, anything that we've shown you today, uh, please go ahead and fill out this quick poll, and we'll give you a moment to do so. And then once you've gone ahead and filled out the poll, uh, we have a few minutes left for Q&A. So we're going to go ahead and pull up some questions and ask those in just a moment. Okay, we're just gonna give everybody another moment to fill out the poll. Okay, great. So now to the Q&A session. All right, so the first question we have, um, I think I'll just go ahead and read it and we can go ahead and, and respond accordingly. The first question is, have you explored the use of surgeons that are nearsighted and farsighted to assess the ability to work for extended periods? You know, I'm, I'm not uh, very familiar with, uh, with those details. I know that um, uh, you can calibrate the uh, the headset, and uh, uh, depending on the headset, you can uh, wear glasses. Maybe Geoff has more uh, uh, input on, uh, into this, but but uh, 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 not not because he has glasses, because <laughs> he works with body uh, or both. But but um, uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, you can really calibrate uh, the device in a way that. Uh, I, I personally don't wear glasses. I think that that uh, it obviously has to be a must because you, you need to have to be able to accommodate right any any sort of uh, visual uh, you know, acuity in order to be able to to um, to use the device. I know that in other headsets you can certainly also do a, a similar a, a not as good but similar a, a calibration to to correct that uh, that deficit. Yeah, and what I would just add is that um, our headset is specifically designed to accommodate glasses. So unless you have glasses even much bigger than these, um, you can put that set on over it and just, you know, goes on and off easily. Yeah. So a follow-up question to that in a similar vein that I think is for Jeff, is, uh, for Dr. For Jeff and for Dr. Gross. I'm sorry, the questions are coming in very quickly. Oh, yeah. Um, so similar to the nearsighted question, um, have you explored users with varying degrees of myopia, hyperopia, presbyopia, pre and assess the impact of IPD on user fatigue? Um, I, I can take that one. Yeah. I, I'm not sure uh, what all those conditions are, but I know that the one, the one advantage that we have here is that our eye tracker is per eye. So for uh, subjects that have strabismus or other, other conditions that would lead to uh, var varying measurements between left eye and right eye, we do accommodate that, but we haven't done any medically rigorous studies with specific conditions. 
Yeah, yeah, and I would say, you know, when when I uh, had the device in my head, you know, when they uh, when I got it, uh, I had to calibrate uh, not just uh, you know the uh, the uh, um, the clarity, right, of the, of the depending on my eyesight, but also uh, you know you have the inter the IPD, the interpupillary distance, right, that that it, it's also a, a variable, and then, then finally when you calibrate the eye tracking, you know you you calibrate the eye tracking and you you basically do a series of uh, you know maneuvers in order to know exactly where your your focal point is, independent of where your eye normally, I mean where where you normally see. Is what you're going to see on the on the device. So uh, if you have glasses or, or other corrective uh, uh, you know ways, then if, when you put the device on, you're going to be seeing exactly. Uh, that's why I'm saying it's like looking through a window. You're not really changing anything. So in that in that uh, in that sense, it's uh, I think uh, a very uh, very easy to uh, I think to address those issues. I, I don't think I personally and I don't think they have studied that specifically. But I think it would be a good uh, really field to. Uh, maybe a, a study and also a, see how those uh, biosensors maybe measure a, a differences but in reality you know since you calibrate the device I think that the, the you know the difference wouldn't be a, a tangible I think yeah okay so this next question is for Dr. Grossman do you think a headset like the XR1 could be helpful to show medical data and real-time guidance during a surgery scenario yeah, well, I hope so. Eventually, you know, these devices obviously are still, uh, <clears throat> although they are really the result of, of, I mean, they are at the top of the course in regards to the, the evolution of the devices, right? They're still devices that, I mean, you you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't wear a, a virtual reality a device a, a, a during a medical procedure or during a medical act, even you know, like even seeing patients, because again, virtual reality, as as we all know, <clears throat> it's uh, immersing you fully, immersing in a digital environment. It's not like AR where you have a digital environment superimposed in the real environment. If you have a device like the Magic Leap, if you have a device like the HoloLens and even the Google Glass, you know, was the first, you know, I was the first surgeon who ever did a live surgery during a wearing Google Glass. And that was, I think, the first iteration of having a, a, a an augmented reality I, I was seeing through and I had the little glass cube, and I was seeing a, a, a digital image sort of almost floating, right, superimposed in. So you can use devices like this during a life uh, a surgery or any medical procedure because you're not fully excluded from the real environment uh, of the patient himself or herself. Device like this is uh, certainly not not possible, not, not to this point. Uh, I'm pretty sure I know the XR1, <clears throat> I believe that's the, the proper uh, name, right, the XR1 AGO. Uh, yeah. So the XR1, I had the chance to use it. I, I gave a keynote recently at the FDA, and we actually brought the XR1, and we had a live demo uh, uh, during part of my talk. And that device allows for VR and AR, so you can see through the device, and you can have. So that device definitely, you know, once the device uh, be, you know, evolves some more and becomes smaller, and and uh, uh, is is a very ergonomic device, but still it's heavy in a way. So despite the the great design, you still, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to wear the device for two hours in, in, during surgery, but you could potentially have a, an evolution of that device uh, uh, during surgery. Like, like we have plenty of data now that, that shows people uh, using, for example, HoloLens uh, to, uh, during medical procedures and interventional cardiology, for example. Dr. Atul Gupta is, is doing that, along with Philips and you know, Microsoft and Philips, and also devices like the Magic Leap, which I'm, I'm, I'm a healthcare advisor for, for Magic Leap. Uh, Magic Leap uh, uh, has paired with Brain Lab, which is a, you know, like a very well-known company in, in, in surgery, and uh, you know, that device can be used during the diagnostic phase of, of surgical procedures because you see through and you see basically a 3D representation of a, a, a radiologic images, for example. So those devices are certainly the future and I have no doubt it's going to be the same for a device like XR1. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so we have a few more, a time for a few more questions. So I think the next one is for Jeff. Uh, in your experience, does the VARIA tracking and resolution decrease the sense of nausea seen that certain in certain percent of population with VR? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the short answer to this is yes, but the, the long answer is we, we don't have um, like a rigorous study, so it's all anecdotal. But what we've seen um, 
over and over again at conferences with end user feedback and everything is that we do have a much lower incidence of nausea, nausea and simulator sickness. And um, I think that's really due to two, two main things. One is um, our eye tracking allows for an automatic IPD adjustment. So what this means is that every time someone puts the headset on, it's um, adjusting to their specific inner pupillary distance. And I think that that's something that when the setting is manual or, or different in other headsets, it's much, it's much less reliable and much less precise. So sometimes people don't do it, sometimes they do it wrong, and it can lead to a lot of sickness. And then I think the other thing is that really I do think the resolution contributes to this because when there's things like the screen door effect, I think your brain is fighting competing signals about what you're looking at. And when you can see something that's really sharp, that's very realistic, you're less distracted, you're not having competing signals, and you can focus more on what you're doing. Definitely. Thank you. Okay, so another follow-up for Jeff. How do I access a library of environments that work for Vario? Um, yeah, so that is a great question. Um, Orama VR is a great one, and we've used uh, their content for this, this webinar. Um, and then we also work with a bunch of other engines and content developers. So there's lists available, you can contact us. And also anything that's built in Unreal and Unity, we do a really good job of, of uh, documenting the port over. So uh, generating content uh, in Unity from scratch that's compatible with Vario or migrating something that's already made is actually quite simple. And it has basically to do with just converting a two viewport rendering, a left eye, right eye to four viewport where it's left eye context and focus, right eye context and focus. Um, and we have lots of good resources uh, to, and, and we are happy to also walk people through making their own. Okay, so a uh, question now about the iMotions platform. Um, what are the data analysis options? Can we define AOIs? Uh, yes, so uh, certainly within iMotions, there are a number of different analysis tools available for visual attention and eye tracking, as well as some of the other measures we integrate. So you certainly can identify areas of interest uh, and get typical measures based off fixation or gaze from those AOIs. Uh, you also are able to generate aggregated heat maps um, and really leverage our advanced gaze mapping technology. Uh, so in virtual environments, for example, you can imagine that each person is going through at a different rate, uh, might do things in a slightly different order, uh, and you can leverage our gaze mapping technology by taking a, um, providing a reference image or a screenshot of a scene that everyone will see at one point during the virtual environment, and then literally map everyone's gaze onto that reference image, allowing for aggregations um, and added insights there. So those are some of the visual analysis tools we have available. We also have a series of built-in uh, signal processing flows using our notebooks, um, such as EDA or GSR peak detection that separates out the phasic and tonic levels of the EDA signal, allowing for insights into things like EDA peak detection. Uh, we have a number of analysis tools integrated for ECGs, such as heart rate variability, as well as other signals as well. So um, we've tried to expand our, our li built-in library of uh, post-processing tools uh, and certainly have uh, been mastering the visual attention ones for about 15, over 15 years now. So we, we do quite a bit available as well as full raw data export. And then the next question, for uh, Jeff and Raphael, uh, this is a COVID-19 hygiene question. <laughs> <laughs> Topical? Thank um, you. In light, of, yeah, in light of the uh, corona disinfection, uh, is, it, is it necessary to uh, clean the mask between participants? Uh, assuming that the clean, that cleaning the mask with alcohol gel is not recommended. Uh, and follow up, are you considering using the well-established use of UVC light as a way of cleaning 99.9% .9 of the virus and bacteria? You said you, UV light is what you said? Uh, yeah, UV yeah. light or other cleaning techniques. You know, I, I can uh, maybe start the, the, the answer. Uh, so uh, there is, that's a great question, by the way, because a lot of these technologies, like like many things in life that we used to do before the COVID-19, now we have to do different or at least thinking differently, right? 
And uh, uh, so it's a good time to say, you know, I, I, I preach social distancing and wearing masks and, uh, you know, being prudent because the, the consequences of not being prudent can be devastating in this particular pandemic. But uh, there are companies uh, out there, uh, especially I want to talk, uh, and again, without any conflict of interest uh, uh, to declare, a uh, clean box, for example, is a company that, uh, that has been uh, uh, created and uh, thought of. A, a, as a, a company that devises a, a, a way to, a, in a very a, a easy and a very, a, in a way, inexpensive and a spe especially a, a, a successful way, a sanitize or a sterilize devices using UV a, a light. It's not just an UV light that you buy a bulb and you put it there. No, this is a specifically engineered to put a headset or a number of headsets within a box a clean box is the name of the company clean box and basically a, a attached a, i mean attain this uh, this goal so uh, it's been very very uh, uh, i would say popular you know growing tremendously and uh, uh, to also a company that also uh, was in a way obviously affected uh, by the covid 19 in a way that they are now they have been redesigning reshaping their their solution in order to sterilize masks for example a, N95 N95 masks. So the, the answer is, is is yes. There is ways to sanitize, and if you go to a conference, uh, you know the old way of uh, of cleaning the device with uh, with specific uh, you know uh, a, a antiseptic or or, or a sterilizing solution. You know, Geoff can probably talk about that because it's a it's a delicate device. I think in, in that sense, you don't want to clean it with uh, you know with uh, with uh, some Clorox or something. I would think, but uh, there is a way, very professional and uh, very uh, successful of uh, a sterilizing these devices to allow for interuses and that's very important because VR in healthcare is here to stay. You have people like Dr. Brennan Spiegel at Cedar sinai that, that really is one of the pioneers in this field. VR devices are going to be there for providers and for patients. VR is therapy, VR is to learn, so VR devices need to be a safe a, to interuse. Yeah, and I think we have time for just a few more questions. Uh, so this next one again for Dr. Grossman, have you used machine learning to change the training to suit the trainee, uh, for example, stress management training tailored to use? No, I, I haven't, but but I've seen uh, uh, you know examples of, of this, and obviously you know when when we when we talk about exponential medicine, we have to talk about AI. I think AI is uh, is uh, you know is, is is been here for 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 decades and it's just uh, been talked more about these days. I, I, I've been uh, also very passionate about uh, the studying AI and how that applies to learning and to to healthcare. I recently finished a, a a course at MIT that deals with AI in in business and in healthcare. And uh, you know AI is machine learning, is robotics, and is natural language processing. All those three apply for something like this, for example. And absolutely, you can imagine. How how uh, you know visual recognition, uh, step recognition, uh, uh, you know variable recognition, biosensing variable recognition can can be in a way optimized and imagine even giving a, a, you know clues or stimuli a, a, in a good way or a bad way to someone who's learning in order to guide them through getting to that zone to that it area in a faster way that's all possible and you know there's so many things that we can do i think the, the really the, the the we're only limited by how creative uh, we are i had a question for roxana that i wanted to maybe plug in here that uh, you know and, and or for eye motions uh, well eye motions uh, but uh, you know eeg for example we see devices like the, the muse device right there's a headband that measures your eeg it's like a portable eeg that has evolved obviously uh, over the last very few years and you can play with your EEG, with your electroencephalogram, with your electrical uh, uh, brain activity, and you can modulate that and learn to give yourself feedback, biofeedback, in order to reach that level of calmness. So something like this would be, I think, really interesting. And maybe they have done it already, but I think that measuring EEG a, a, among one of those uh, variables, physiologic variables, would be very, very interesting because you can see someone reaching that level and, and maybe the room color might change or maybe the setting might change in a way if you're getting more and more relaxed and you're getting there and you can try to get there faster. So these are very exciting fields of, uh, of research, I think. Yeah, uh, to, to follow up on the, the EEG um, overview, I've spent many years of my life using many different EEG systems. 
um, for my graduate research and, uh, of course, at iMotions as well. Uh, there, there are many consumer grade systems out there like the Muse um, and others that uh, are, are meant for, you know, consumer use, meditating at home, trying to, you know, introductory education into what EEG even is, what are these signals. And then there are the more heavy research grade ones that provide more of these insights and allow for some of the heavy biofeedback. Uh, so certainly the biofeedback is a very interesting field and it's used broadly from addiction research to um, behavioral therapy and others. And I think that there are many applications for that. Um, the, the challenge with EEG has always been that there is a lot of noise. It, it is picking up electrical signals, very mild electrical signals from the surface of the scalp and it has to have really good connection to the scalp. Um, and follow up to that, the reason that it wasn't really um, accessible by the public for decades uh, is that because it, it does require quite a bit of signal processing expertise to really properly clean the data, depending on your research question and what your insights are. Um, so now that there have been advances in these tools, it's still a bit tricky to use, especially in um, virtual reality settings, just because not only is there uh, movement from the headset itself on the participant's face, but there is electrical noise from the headset itself that may interfere with the signals picked up from the scalp. That being said, I don't think that it's impossible. I think that someone really clever out there will come up with a really good solution to this in probably a few years. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that day when that happens. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, we're gonna go ahead and I think stop at this point. We've had some really solid questions. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and thank the panelists and all the attendees today. Yeah. Um, everyone who's attended, uh, you will receive, or even sign up, you will receive a recording of this uh, webinar in the next few days. And again, a super special thank you to both Jeff and Dr. Grossman. You guys are amazing and this has been a really fun experience. So I'm glad we were able to pull this together and do this. Um, and on our final slide, we actually have our contact info. So if you want to get in touch with any of us, uh, please go ahead and uh, you know connect with us on LinkedIn. You can tweet Dr. Grossman. And I've also uh, included our uh, colleagues over at Orama VR's information in case you want to get more information about that environment as well. So go ahead and reach out to us if you have any additional questions. Uh, connect, and we look forward to hearing from you all soon. Thank, Thank you, you so Roxana. Much. Thank you, Gio. Thank you, Thank you, all of you. Thanks. Bye. Have a good day.